Uh, first off, uh, Dean Baker uh, holds a PhD in economics from the University of Michigan, and he currently co-directs the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, D.C. He's frequently cited in economics reporting in major media outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, CNBC, and National Public Radio. He writes a weekly column for The Guardian Unlimited, and his blog, Beat the Press, features commentary on economic reporting. His analyses have appeared in many major publications, including The Atlantic Monthly, The Washington Post, and The London Financial Times. Dean has written and contributed to several books, and I'll only mention a few of these. Uh, his latest book, uh, Taking Economics Seriously, published by MIT Press, thinks through what we might gain if we took the ideological blinders off of basic economic principles. In 2009, he wrote Plunder and Blunder, The Rise and Fall of the Bubble Economy, which chronicles the growth and collapse of the stock and housing bubbles and explains how policy blunders and greed led to the catastrophic but completely predictable market meltdowns. His book, Getting Prices Right, which was published in 1997, was a winner of the Choice Book Award as one of the outstanding academic books of that year. Josh Gordon is the policy director of the Concord Coalition, a nonpartisan grassroots organization dedicated to educating the public about federal budget issues and their consequences for the future. The Concord Coalition was founded in 1992 by former U.S. Senators Warren Rudman and the late Paul Songus, and former Secretary of Commerce Peter Peterson. Mr. Gordon directs the Concord Coalition's research on the federal budget, health care policy, and tax policy, and is the editor of the Concord's blog, The Tabulation. He frequently discusses Concord's positions in public speeches and interviews with the media. He also directs Concord's academic outreach and educational activities, including its classroom curriculum and its budget simulations, and was a research advisor for the Sundance Film Festival documentary, IOUSA. He has been with Concord since 2001. Mr. Gordon has a PhD in political science from the University of Florida and wrote his dissertation on the budget process and the House Appropriations Committee. He also has a master's degree from the University of Florida and taught classes there on American politics and on Congress. He received his bachelor's degree from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so we're going to start uh, with, uh, with opening comments from, from Josh, and then we'll uh, turn it over to Dean's opening statement. Okay. Thank you very much for having me here. <coughs> Did I forget my clicker? I forgot my clicker. Here you go. I'll try and rush through these, and I imagine anything I skip over will uh, get to uh, during the question and answer period. Let me first show you about the last 30 years of fiscal policy uh, for the country. Uh, we average about 21% of GDP in outlays, about 18% in revenues. Um, you can see that. There was a uh, slight shift in that in the late 90s. Uh, we actually reversed those lines, and that's why we had about four years of budget surpluses. Um, quickly after that, those budget surpluses disappeared with uh, large tax cuts, spending on uh, defense uh, and homeland security, and uh, got back close to average by 2007. And then with the recession and the financial crisis, uh, the lines have uh, drastically diverged. Uh, now, that's for a, a number of reasons. Uh, the revenue line has dropped uh, tremendously because of uh, people earning less and less workers having jobs paying taxes. Uh, and right now it stands at about 15% of GDP, which is actually the lowest level of revenue since 1950. Uh, and that's, uh, 1950 was before we had uh, Medicare and Medicaid and uh, the, the slightly more modern government that we have now, still funded on that 1950s era uh, revenue base, which is a huge problem. Uh, and then the spending has gone up as well. Um, a lot of that spending increase is because of the automatic stabilizers in the budget, the mandatory spending that kicks in whenever the economy goes down, uh, unemployment insurance, food stamps, child nutrition, all of those programs rise in spending uh, when there's an economic drop. Uh, and then also you have the stimulus bill uh, and uh, a few other smaller uh, economy-related spending bills. Uh, so that's led to this tremendous divergence, which gives us um, the largest uh, budget deficit as a percent of GDP since World War II. We're at about 10 percent of GDP, uh, with deficits about $1.4 trillion last year, this year, and somewhere close to a trillion dollars projected for next year. 
Uh, one of the biggest uh, changes in the budget is that uh, we've gone from having discretionary spending, which is the spending Congress controls annually uh, through the appropriations process, go from about two-thirds of the federal budget to about one-third of the federal budget. Uh, this means Congress has less annual uh, control over uh, spending. It also means that the discretionary spending budget is the budget get, that gets squeezed as the autopilot programs can continue to take up a larger share of federal budgetary resources. Uh, and this is one of the main problems with uh, the growth in the future is that you're going to have mandatory spending programs and interest uh, begin to consume more and more of the federal budget, leaving the investment part of the budget, which is in that non-defense discretionary uh, slice of the budget, uh, being underinvested in uh, while we overpromise and overspend uh, in Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security relative to the overall size of the budget. Uh, now, uh, a lot of the public that I talk to thinks that the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are the sole uh, cause of our spending problem over the last five or ten years. Uh, if you look historically, though, we're actually spending less as a percent of GDP than we've averaged since the 60s. Uh, the Cold War uh, involved a tremendous amount of defense spending. We brought that down to a low, coincidentally or not, around the time of those budget surpluses, and then it's inched back up with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and future projections of spending, though, assume that defense spending shrinks again as a percent of GDP, uh, at least slightly to about 4%. So when we look forward, uh, while there are a lot of savings we can find in the defense budget, uh, that's not nearly enough to make up for the increase in spending elsewhere in the budget, and so it's not really a silver bullet. Uh, if we look over the next 10 years, uh, there are two ways of projecting budget deficits. The Congressional Budget Office uh, projects a total uh, combined deficits of $6 trillion over the next 10 years. Unfortunately, that assumes that Congress and the President leave Washington and don't do anything for the next 10 years. Uh, in that case, you would have the big tax cuts from 01 and 03 expire. You would have the alternative minimum tax taking a larger bite uh, out of middle class incomes. You would have uh, this physician payment fix under Medicare um, uh, expire. Right now, doctors in December who treat Medicare patients are scheduled to get about a 23% cut uh, in reimbursement rates. Uh, we've been on that precipice a lot for the last five years. Congress has never allowed it to happen. Um, yet the CBO kind of projects that that's the case. Uh, the red line is what Conquer does to adjust that uh, what we call implausible, relatively conservative baseline from CBO and assume that Congress and the President continue current policy trends. So we assume that the tax cuts are extended. We assume AMT is continually fixed. We assume that the doctor payments are continually fixed. Uh, and we assume that discretionary spending continues to increase at the same rate as economic growth. The top line assumes inflation only uh, for non-defense discretionary spending and, and defense discretionary spending. So uh, under our more plausible assumptions, we we'll still assume a relatively rapid recovery um, for the economy. You're looking at an additional $15 trillion worth of deficits over the next 10 years. Right now, the total national debt is about $14 trillion. The publicly held debt is $8 trillion. So this would about double or more uh, our total amount of debt uh, for the country in just 10 years. Oh, well, I'm going to have to cycle through this. Oh. All right, so if you look at debt held by the public, which is uh, a pretty generic measure of uh, our overall debt burden, you can see that the highest ever was during World War II. Uh, that was about 109%. Uh, by the end of 2010, uh, in, in uh, just a few days, we're expected to finish the year with about 64% uh, of GDP debt held by the public. And then the projections just in the next 30 years are for that debt held by the public to increase to about 300%. Uh, in 10 years, uh, you're looking at about the same levels as we had during World War II. Uh, unfortunately, it won't be a one-time increase like World War II was. It really represents a permanent um, shift and in increase in that debt if we don't make policy changes. So it goes from 100% to 200% to 300% relatively quickly. Um, now, uh, most economists that I know do not think this will actually happen. Uh, the country 
wouldn't be able to continue borrowing if we were getting to the 300% range. Uh, so really the question that Concord poses to policymakers and to the public is, are we going to keep adding on this debt and not act until there's some crisis that forces us to act? Or are we going to make changes now that can phase in over time that can slow uh, that growth of our debt? And as we've seen in Greece, when a country gets into deep debt problems, uh, there are relatively few uh, good options. All the options are bad, and uh, that doesn't even mean they'll work, uh, even though they're bad options and, and drastic options. Uh, so really, the goal is to prevent that from happening, um, and, and, all, and what that requires is change in our policies. Now, most of that debt, uh, about over 50% of the debt we hold right now is held by foreign governments, or the debt we borrow uh, is held by foreign governments, foreign investors. Uh, and this is a problem because it means instead of those interest payments staying here in the country, we're sending those interest payments overseas to reinvest in their economy. It also means uh, we, we aren't um, using those budgetary resources in a more productive way uh, inside our economy. So over the last 10 years, about 70% of all debt we've accumulated has been borrowed from overseas. So the 50% number actually uh, is, is better than recent history suggests because recently uh, we're borrowing more and more from overseas. Uh, now, if you look at the main causes of growth uh, in this debt, uh, we project that revenues stay at about the normal rate, 18.3%. Uh, but then you look at the spending side, and that's where the spending really goes out of whack from where we normally are. Um, and that's for two reasons. Uh, the population is aging and healthcare costs are growing much more quickly than economic growth. Um, so uh, here's what happens to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid uh, over the next 70 years. By 2035, about 63% of the growth is because of the aging population, and 37% of the growth is because of health care costs. Uh, and then by 2080, health care costs um, uh, become a more important factor than aging. But this is something that was largely missing from the debate over health care reform, the fact that by 2035 we have an aging population that contributes more uh, than excess cost growth or health care cost growth does to our federal budgetary problems. And so for Social Security, uh, you have a revenue stream coming in and you have outlays going out and very quickly those, uh, those lines which have been uh, in surplus because we've been taking in more in taxes than we've been paying out in benefits uh, cross and you start to spend more on Social Security than you're taking in through Social Security taxes uh, which opens up these cash deficits uh, at their largest it's about 1.4 percent of GDP deficit in Social Security so it's not a huge problem but 1.4 <clears throat> percent of GDP is a large problem especially when you combine that with uh, the problems in Medicare and if you look at the projected federal spending on health care uh, after the recent health care reform, uh, recent health care reform, at least in the projections, did not do very much uh, to change our overall trajectory of growth in these programs, still going from about 5.5% of GDP to over 10% of GDP uh, by 2040. Uh, so that's just this one segment of the budget devoted to health care doubling uh, in the next 30 years that would be like adding an entire another defense department onto the federal budget over the next 30 years uh, if we don't make changes. That doesn't mean the health care reform law was a failure. Uh, there are a lot of good ideas in this, and the real key is whether politicians uh, and uh, the interest groups involved will allow reform to work and that Congress will continue to press uh, for changes that um, increase cost control in our system. The legislation was the beginning of the beginning of being able to do that. It wasn't the uh, end of our fight uh, towards controlling health care costs. Um, and uh, I know um, Dean is going to probably say something. If only we had uh, the same health care systems as other countries, we would be in better shape. But if you actually look at the growth in spending, the health care inflation in other countries, we're not actually that far out of whack uh, from other countries. We're starting at a much higher level of per capita healthcare spending, and we don't have any better healthcare outcomes because of it. But if you look towards the future, it's those growth, it's the growth in those healthcare costs that are really damaging to the federal budget. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, 
very few countries have actually figured out exactly how to slow uh, that cost growth uh, in their healthcare programs. And we really think it would be a major victory if we got it down to this 1% of GDP excess cost growth. But even if you did that, you have the healthcare programs of the federal budget uh, doubling uh, in the next 40 to 50 years. So uh, we really have to rethink how we pay for healthcare uh, and, and how we're going to um, uh, afford the government programs and how we're either going to raise revenues to pay for them or uh, impose tighter budget controls on the government uh, portion of healthcare. Unfortunately, you can't just cap government spending on healthcare and expect that to take care of it because if the private sector has the same cost growth uh, that the public sector does, uh, it, it won't work. So if you look over the next 30 years, the sources of growth for the federal budget uh, and all of these projections that get you to that uh, debt held by the public of 300%, uh, you're looking at Medicaid, Social Security, Medicare much larger, and then interest on the debt uh, even larger than that. And then in just the next 15 years, those four spending items consume all federal revenues, meaning any additional dollar for defense spending, education spending, research and development, you name it, has to be borrowed or cut completely. Uh, and obviously that's not going to happen, so again, it's about uh, lowering the amount we have to borrow, and that simply means you figure out what kind of government you want, and then you pay for that government. Uh, you can't have a big government spending policy and a small government tax policy, and vice versa. And that all stopped there. Okay, as you can imagine, I, I do see a few things differently. Um, uh, what I want to argue is, first off, I think it's really sort of almost bizarre we're talking about a budget deficit today because we have 9.6 percent unemployment, probably going over 10 by early next year. This is a real disaster, and it's a little bizarre. It's sort of like we're sitting here, kind of the fallout of a war. You know, we have people dying all over the place, and we're going, you know, 30 years from now, we're going to have real bad deficits. It's a little, little strange. What I want to say is that the current deficits are not at all a problem. If we had smaller deficits, if I snap my finger and we got rid of the Department of Government Waste, Fraud and Abuse and we saved $500 billion, we'd have a lot more people unemployed. That would be the impact. We do not want smaller deficits today. The deficit today is zero problem. Over the longer term, we do face an issue. It's not budget deficits, it's health care costs. If we got our health care costs under control, the rest of the matter would be easily manageable. And so th those are the two main points I want to make. I just want to respond to a couple things here. Um, first off, where do we face a crisis? Does anyone know how large Japan's debt is relative to its GDP? 200%. It's over 200%. It's about 220%. You know what interest uh, the bond vigilantes, the bad guys who hold governments accountable, you know what they make Japan pay in the, the in, in financial markets, 10-year bonds? About 1.6%. I haven't checked. Maybe it's 1.7 today. Okay, so, so we're really far from hitting any constraints, really, really far. In other words, we got a long, long way to go before we're Greece. A lot of things will happen before we look like Greece. Other point I want to make, a lot of people make this argument, I think it's just a real confusion, a, a, dis, a problem understanding economics. The issue about debt held by foreigners, if you're concerned about that, talk about the trade deficit. That's why foreigners hold debt. That's how they're able to do it. We have a big trade deficit. You want to get the debt held by foreigners down? Get the dollar down. That's what, that's what leads to the trade deficit. That's what leads to foreigners holding our debt. It has nothing to do with the budget deficit. If we're worried about foreigners owning U.S. assets, and I don't, I don't particularly care whether they hold U.S. government bonds. I mean, the issue is money leaving the country. Would it make us feel any different if they hold, held all the stock of corporations on, on you know, the New York Stock Exchange? I mean, the point is money leaving the country. Who help, cares whether it's government bonds? If we, and if it's something particularly important about government bonds, any day they want, they could sell the stock, the other assets they hold, and buy government bonds. So this is just silliness. It's just misleading. It has absolutely nothing to do with the budget deficit. Absolutely nothing to do. It's just silliness. Okay. Well, where are we today in terms of uh, the budget deficit? As I was saying, we're, we're here with very large budget deficits because we had an economic collapse. And I will say, at least part of the story of economic collapse, this has me really angry. I don't, I can blame Josh here. But um, 
a lot of the budget hawks were running around 05, 06, 07, when some of us were saying, hey, we got a huge housing bubble that's going to wreck the economy. They were going, oh, my God, we got to worry about the budget deficit in 2030. We were drowned out by people yelling about a budget deficit in 2030, so we couldn't do anything about the housing bubble, which, by the way, if you care about the budget deficit, we got a big one because we had a housing bubble that collapsed. What did that mean? Two things. Housing bubble was driving the economy back in 04, 05, 06. We had a huge amount of construction, huge amount of consumption. People spent based on the wealth in their homes. Well-known wealth effect. Economists have been writing about it for probably a century. Okay, that collapsed. That meant we lost over $1.2 trillion in private sector demand. Okay, that gave us a huge amount of unemployment. Got us high over 10%. We'll probably get back to 10%. That also kicked in the automatic stabilizers, and we had the stimulus plan. You don't like the stimulus? How do you feel about more unemployment? The point is the private sector wasn't going to spend. If we didn't have the demand from the government, we wouldn't have it. So if you're unhappy about the budget deficits, then you're going out advocating for more unemployment. I think that's a real bad idea. Some people might want more people to be unemployed. I'm not in that boat. In terms of that creating an interest burden, important thing to understand what's go what goes on with when we issue bonds in this sort of context where we have large-scale unemployment, it creates no burden whatsoever. It creates no debt burden whatsoever. What could happen, what should happen, and it is happening to some extent, the Federal Reserve simply buys those bonds. So the Federal Reserve is doing that to some extent. There's also buying mortgage-backed securities. What happens when the Federal Reserve buys bonds doesn't create an interest burden for our children, our grandchildren. What happens is the interest gets paid to the Federal Reserve, and what does the Federal Reserve do every year? They rebate the interest back to the Treasury. Last year they rebated $77 billion in interest. It was almost 40 percent of all our interest burden was rebated right back to the Treasury. That didn't show up in the numbers here. Okay, but if the Federal Reserve did what they should do and what Japan's central bank has done, they would simply buy up the government bonds issued during this period of high unemployment and the interest would simply go right back to the Treasury. Now some of you may be going, oh, well that would cause inflation. That'd be wonderful cause of inflation. We could really use a little bit of inflation. Our problem right now is, is deflation, or at least very, very low inflation rates. Um, if we started to get some moderate rate of inflation, say 3 or 4 percent, that'd be an enormous boon to growth. What that would do is lower the real interest rate. It would give firms more incentive to invest, and we'd actually start to come out of this downturn much more quickly. Unfortunately, I don't think that's likely to happen, but we have no reason to fear inflation now. Now, of course, we would fear inflation if we start to see it go up to, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 percent, but that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen overnight. You don't go from a situation of having 10 percent unemployment to suddenly having hyperinflation, not overnight. Okay, so I would say over the short term, the whole idea we should be concerned about the deficits and the debt we're going to build up because we have this downturn, it's nonsense. There's literally nothing to worry about there. We should be building up more debt. We should be employing more people. That's the tragedy. We have 15 million people unemployed right now because there's not enough demand in the economy. Also, 9 million underemployed. Millions more have left the workforce altogether. That's the tragedy. People's lives are being ruined because we're not running bigger deficits. That's, that, that is a real tragedy. And I should say it's also due to total totally preventable economic mismanagement. Now, the longer-term story, we are looking at a serious longer-term problem. It's overwhelmingly health care. And I'll point out, you know, we could look at 2000, 2008. We could go back further, look at 1970 to 2008. And what you'd see is that the U.S. had a hell of a lot more excess cost growth than everyone else. If you go back to 1970, the U.S. was not the most expensive country per capita. We spent, we were about third, fourth on the list. We are a little higher than the OECD average, but not much. Currently, we're about two and a half times the OECD average. So I hadn't looked at those particular eight years. I've looked at a longer period. And in terms of excess cost growth, and by the way, we've had more aging than most countries. Japan has an older population than us. Sweden has an older po Most countries have an older population than us. So aging has been more of a factor in the other countries, yet we've had much more rapid growth in health care costs. Now, my chart like that shows the long-term budget projections where I say, suppose that per person health care spending in the United States was, and we have a little calculator on our website, we say, pick your country. Any country has a longer life expectancy in the U.S., and that's a lot of countries these days. Pick your country, and what did this budget deficit look like? Well, guess what? We have surpluses. Okay. We have, our, our spending is way more than everyone else today, and the gap is projected to increase. If we instead were able to spend the same amount as England, Germany, Canada, whichever country you like that has a longer life expectancy than us, and they all do, then we wouldn't be looking at budget surpluses 40 years out, budget deficits 40 years out. We'd be looking at surpluses. So the story I say about that 
is we have a long-term health care problem. We have to fix our health care system. And, you know, that's what we should be talking about. If we fix our health care system and we get a health care system that's efficient as, as efficient as what they have basically in every other wealthy country in the world, then we're going to be looking at surpluses, not deficits. So we're deluding ourselves. The, the, the analogy I often make in this regard is suppose that we were forecasting that we were going to have a nuclear war, you know, 15 years out. And you say, well, what do deficits look like 20 years out? They look really bad, right? You know, you expect this nuclear war in 2000, 2025. Well, in 2030, your economy is going to be destroyed. You have all these, you know, people who are sick and dying and, you know, well, we'd have a really bad budget deficit. You'd be a little wacky to be saying, oh, my God, we've got to worry about the budget deficit. That's kind of what we're doing here. We have to worry about health care. We have to fix our health care system. It's incredibly inefficient. If we fix our health care system, the other problems are readily manageable. No one in their right mind would be running around yelling about budget deficits if these charts were adjusted for a health care system where it was as efficient as any other country in the world. So we don't have a deficit problem. We have a health care problem. A couple other points I just want to make quickly. Um, one, the assumption of taxes. I, you know, I, I, was, I was struck, I first came to Washington about 18 years ago, and I remember I was on a panel, and one of the other people on the panel said, you know, we, we always spend, a, our taxes are always about 18 percent. They might have said 20 percent because they were a little higher back then. This was the Clinton years. But in any case, you know, our tax burden is always about the same, 18 percent of GDP. And I was sort of struck by that. I go, is that really true? And I looked at that, and that is true. But if you go back, you know, go back to the early 50s, you find, well, we didn't pay that much in payroll taxes. We paid very little because not everyone, we didn't have Medicare. Not everyone was covered by Social Security. And the Social Security tax back then was about 3% as opposed to 12.4%. So I said, well, what, what, what happened here? Well, what happened is we cut income taxes. The amount of money going to income taxes has fallen a great deal. The amount of money going to corporate income taxes has fallen a great deal. That's been largely replaced by payroll taxes. So then rather than staring at that and going, oh, we have some mysterious force that keeps us at 18%, you know, the twilight zone, I go, well, what we did was we gave big tax breaks to corporations, big tax breaks to higher end people. They're paying a much smaller share of GDP in taxes, and instead we're taxing people much more, working people much more at their payroll taxes. I don't see there's a magic to 18 percent, so I guess I just I don't see this constraint as being quite as binding. I mean, we could draw any line we want out, but I just don't think that makes any obvious sense. One last point that I'll make that um, I, I, I've come to emphasize this because I realize people really don't know it, and it's just incredible that uh, there's so many discussions on the deficit that don't talk about this. People are going to be richer in the future. There is no projection I know of that doesn't show future generations being much richer than current generations. I remember I was once on a show with Alan Simpson, Senator Alan Simpson, this is back when he was a senator, but he's now the co-chair of the Deficit Commission, and he was complaining back then they were trying to cut Social Security, and they were saying that the, the consumer price index overstated inflation, and the standard number most people was using by one percentage point. And he said, well, he talks to economists that tell him it might be two, might even be two and a half. And he said, our grandchildren are going to be living in chicken coops. Okay, suppose Senator Simpson knew arithmetic. You aren't required to do that to be a senator. But suppose he knew arithmetic. Let's imagine he's right. His friends, his economists are right. Two percent. CPI overstates inflation by two percent. Let's do the arithmetic. We know nominal wage growth. You know, that we have data on that. So we could, let, let's, for the moment, this was the 90s, nominal wages were growing. So 4% nominal wage growth. The consumer price index tells us that inflation is 3%. Okay, so we look at that 4% nominal wage growth, 3% inflation, that gives us 1% real wage growth, year by year, 1%. Okay, the ex, all these people are saying that consumer price index overstrates the true rate, true rate of inflation by a percentage point. So that means if, you know, we got the word from God, it's 2% inflation, not 3 that means real wages are growing 2% a year, 4 minus 2. Okay. People are getting richer more quickly. Not 1% a year, they're getting richer at the rate of 2% a year. Alan Simpson goes, no, 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 he's got these economists and he's telling them it overstates inflation by 2% a year. Okay, well, if that's true, 4% nominal wage growth. The CPI says 3%, but that's overstated by 2 percentage points. So inflation is just 1%. People are getting richer at the rate of 3% a year. So you carry that out, 20 years, their income's going to double. Carry it out 40 years, their income's going to be four times as high as it is today. Okay, well, Simpson was wrong about that. But the point is, under almost any plausible scenario, our children, our grandchildren are going to be much, much richer than we are, which is important for two things in terms of this debate. When we talk about generational equity, I can't think of a story. I've been on panels that go, oh, what about the taxes I pay? I say, tell you what, friend, I'll pay your taxes. You give me your income. And if they take that, then we really have failed them because they've had a bad education. Okay, so there is not a generational issue here. There's not a budget issue here. 
There's a health care issue here. We should all be talking about fixing the health care system. If we fix our health care system, the other issues are relatively minor. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, so what I was planning on doing is starting with a few questions which were more general and more geared towards the long-term problem, and then I'm going to go towards things that are more specific and more about the current situation. And this isn't really meant to be a debate. It's more just uh, intended to be a question and answer session with interesting conversation with, with you two. Um, so the first question I had uh, has to do with the, one of the graphs that Josh showed, uh, uh, which, which demonstrated that over the last three decades or so, federal budgets have been in surplus for only a, a couple of years. And even then, the surpluses were very small. And even then, the only reason those surpluses existed was because of the surplus we were getting from Social Security, that if you looked at the rest of the bus budget, it was actually still in deficit. Um, and my question is, in, in, in your opinion, why has the federal government been so chronically unable to balance its budget? Uh, even during periods of economic uh, expansion? And is there something that, that, that we can do about it? Is there something about changing the rules of the game or perhaps something you know, we as citizens should be doing differently to get our, our government to take the deficit issue more seriously? And I guess I would direct it first to Josh and, and then, and then uh, let Dean, Dean respond as well. Um, well, my first response is that um, if you run a deficit of about 2% of GDP, on average over time, that's actually a sustainable deficit. As long as your deficit is not, in, or your debt is not increasing more quickly than economic growth, you can, can actually afford to carry additional debt. So uh, obviously the reason why we have those two to three percentage deficit are that uh, it's much easier for members of Congress to cut taxes and raise spending than it is to cut spending and raise taxes. And if there's no reason why they need to do otherwise, because you're running two percentage of GDP deficits and it's not unduly harming your economy, they're gonna to continue to do that. And so when we look in the future, really the goal that, that most of the um, people concerned about the long term, uh, the goal that we have is really to just have deficits at a sustainable level, stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. It probably won't stabilize where we are right now at 64%, if it went up to 70 or 80 percent, there's a strong likelihood that we could survive without major or harmful economic effects going out in the future. But getting it down to that and stabilized at that is going to require fairly heroic changes in either spending or taxes. And, and so the heroic changes um, Dean envisions for healthcare are almost inconceivable in any short period of time uh, for us to get there. So that's why Concord talks about the other programs of the federal budget as well, and that's why we talk about taxes, because you're not just going to suddenly have per capita health care costs uh, that they have in Belgium and, and you, with the flip of a switch. It's just not going to happen. Uh, we're working in the realm of bipartisan uh, political actuality, not um, think tank, best case scenario type government. So that's, that's our general thinking on that. Well, in terms of what's politically practical, a lot depends on where the money goes. So you have Pete Peterson, who, who does in part fund the Concord Coalition, funds a lot of other organizations, and he spends a lot of money focusing on trying to go after programs like Social Security and Medicare. He doesn't like to fund money, like I don't know of any, him putting up anything towards promoting health care reform. So, you know, I'll grant that. I mean, there's a lot of money and power that doesn't want to see the health care system reformed and would rather see us cut Social Security, Medicare, other programs. So. Absolutely, I agree with you on the political realities. We have really big uh, interest groups there that are very, very hard to defeat. But nonetheless, as an academic, I have to say what I think to be true. Um, in terms of just uh, you know the, the budget record, I think you know actually the story, if you look at it honestly, it's it's a very, very mixed picture. That from uh, 1950 to 1980, we, it's true we ran deficits almost every year, but the debt to GDP ratio plummeted over that period. So we got out of the war, you know, World War II, the debt to GDP ratio was over 100%. Uh, by the time President Reagan took office in 1981, it was about 29%. So even though we're running deficits, you know, exactly at this point, they were much smaller, they were small enough so that the debt to GDP ratio was actually falling. So where did things get out of control? Well, during the Reagan years, we had big tax cuts. We had a big military buildup. Those don't go well together. 
um, that led to a big increase in, in, in deficits during that period. And then when President Clinton got in, and I'll be the first to say I'm not a big Clinton fan, but the reality was he did get the deficit down. We got surpluses. So it was a relatively short period in there that, you know, if you look at our post-war history where we had sort of excessive deficits that were raising the debt to GDP ratio. And then, of course, we got back into the problem. Again, I not want to usually go out of my way to beat up on President Bush, but, you know, it's just the reality. We did have more tax cuts in the Bush administration and also uh, a substantial military buildup, 2 percentage points or 1.8 percentage point of GDP. Um, again, those don't go well together. Those gave us deficits. But I'd say for the most, most of our post-war history, we actually have been reasonably responsible in deficits that uh, the debt to GDP ratio has actually generally been falling with, you know, the exceptions of the Reagan-Bush-1 years, and Bush-1 took some steps to reduce the deficit, and uh, during uh, the second Bush administration, the President George W. Bush. And let me just add that that discussion is really about averages, and I think Dean is right that when the economy is growing, that's when your debt-to-GDP ratio should be falling. And so I think that was the main failure in the 2000s, that we had years of declining uh, debt as a percent of GDP and responsible fiscal policy, and then we had another um, session of GDP growth. I won't say economic growth because it certainly wasn't broadly shared in the 2000s, but you did have GDP growing, but you also had the debt to GDP ratio growing, and that was a, a, a huge uh, measure of fiscal irresponsibility with, with the tax cuts along with the defense buildup along with entitlement expansion. So, so what is the conventional wisdom with respect to what's an acceptable level of debt to GDP that we might be shooting for? I think that's something that's hotly contested. I mean, I don't think there is a, a fixed level. I mean, there was a, a book that's been very influential, uh, Reinhardt and uh, Rogoff, where they came up with the number of 90 percent, and I and others have looked at that research and find it very questionable. I mean, there's a lot of good material in that book, but that 90 percent figure I think is very questionable. And there are the, they're examples of countries, there are very few examples of countries where the debt to GDP ratio has exceeded that. that. And it's most often been a case where they got, into, they got into high debt to GDP ratio trouble because their economy was in trouble. And that's easy to show. So I don't think there is a level. And certainly, you know, again, I hold up Japan not because, you know, we want Japan's model as an economy for the U.S. model, U.S. economy. but. There is zero evidence that Japan is facing any problems financing its debt, even though it has a debt to GDP ratio of 220 percent of GDP. So I don't, I don't think there's a clear number that we could look at and say, okay, when you hit that point, you're in trouble. And again, part of this gets to the story that in Japan's case, their central bank actually holds an amount of debt that's roughly equal to their GDP. Um, we could do that here, and the economic meaning of that is essentially zero. So you basically make this debt, in effect, disappear because the interest on the debt each year is paid to the central bank and then it's refunded to the government. And if, if your debt's accrued because you're in a very bad slump, as was the case in Japan or is in the case in the U.S. now, there's no reason not to do that. Uh, so one of the arguments you made, Dean, was that we sh wouldn't have to be concerned about current deficits, uh, at least not until the markets give us some sign that they're unwilling to, to lend to the U.S. government, which according to interest rates on the Treasury bonds, that there doesn't seem to be any indication of that. There, there's another part of the economics community which is concerned that the only reason why interest rates on Treasury bonds have been so low is because of this strong dollar policy that's being pursued by China, who have been buying up Treasuries uh, in order to maintain a stronger do dollar and maintain a stronger uh, trade position with respect to the United States. Um, do you think that that is true? And if our interest rates are only low because of policy actions being taken by the Chinese, um, shouldn't that concern us? Well, I think China certainly played a role in that. But actually, the share, the share of Treasury bonds that's been purchased by U.S. investors has been increasing lately. Partly the story is that there aren't other good investment opportunities. But, you know, if, if it, the point is you do have U.S. investors that are buying and holding U.S. Treasury bonds at very low interest rates, and for that matter, you have uh, investors in other countries as well. But, you know, if China were tomorrow to say that, you know, they want, no longer want to hold U.S. Treasury bonds, I don't doubt that would lead interest rates to rise somewhat. It would also have the very, very beneficial effect, and this is actually what we've been pushing them to do, it would raise the value of their currency against the dollar, which would improve our trade situation, would create a lot of jobs. We wouldn't have to borrow as much. So I'm not really troubled by that story. So, uh, you know, I see that would, that would, to my view, would mostly be positive. You know, if we had the leadership of China and said, well, we're going to stop buying your, your bonds tomorrow, I'd go, thank you. <laughs>
you think other investors would step in and the interest rates wouldn't rise much? That's that's right. I mean, it's a very in the th this is a very market. deep market. So you know, if China's if China's investors weren't, uh, and and that's why the movements tend not to be that big. It's an, it's the deepest market in the world. So if China's investors weren't buying the treasuries at two six, maybe it rises to two seven, two eight, two nine. Hardly interest rates that are, should get us upset. Um. So most economists believe that the eventual solution to the federal deficit is going to involve some amount of tax increases and spending cuts, and I, I assume you two probably share that position as well. Uh, using the current budget as a baseline, if we had to balance the budget, say, in the next few years, or say immediately after we came through the recent job recession. You're an optimist. Uh, <laughs> in five years, let's suppose that, that the job market is back to where it should be, uh, and we had to balance the budget in that year. What combination of tax cuts, I mean, tax increases versus spending cuts, would you envision as being the ideal combination? And where should the spending cuts be focused on? Um, I mean, I think over the next five years, if we assume the Congressional Budget Office's projections for economic growth are accurate, and that's really that unemployment by 2015 is down to 6 percent, which I think um, I think if we could guarantee that right now, I think we'd be fairly happy with that. Um, if, if we assume that that's what's going to happen with the economy, you can look at the Congressional Budget Office baseline and you actually get to primary budget balance, meaning spending and revenues, not counting spending on interest, uh, of a balanced budget. Uh, just by following current law, meaning mainly letting the tax cuts expire. So it actually in the short term is not that difficult to get to uh, a sustainable level of budget deficits. The problem is that only holds for a, a short amount of time before uh, the baby boom generation uh, retires, leaves the workforce, and then gets on Social Security and Medicare in substantial numbers. So over the short term, it's actually fairly easy, although I'm skeptical we, one, would uh, allow, allow those the tax, tax cuts, cuts to expire, expire, and also I'm skeptical that the economy can improve that quickly um, uh, because, again, Congress isn't taking any action to help that, and, and I don't, I'm not sure where the economic growth is actually going to come from, uh, absent uh, the government's getting involved. And so uh, Concord is not opposed to additional efforts over the short term to uh, spend more to stimulate the economy. Um, but then you get to the point where you're looking at 2020 and 2030, and then you really have to uh, not just let tax revenues rise to that pre-Bush tax cut level, uh, you probably need to find other sources of revenue and you need to start cutting spending. And that can come from a combination of defense spending, Social Security, and Medicare and Medicaid. And the key is that for those long-term entitlement programs, any changes need to be phased in over the long term. Uh, because you're not going to cut Social Security now uh, for current retirees because that doesn't make any sense. Uh, you're going to want to have retirees get used to the changes um, that you're going to make in Social Security and prepare for them by staying in the workforce longer and saving more uh, before they get on Social Security. So uh, over the long term, you're looking at spending restraint. And over the, long, uh, the short term, you're looking at uh, revenue increases. OK, well, a couple of things. First off, we're going to have the growth because the Chinese are going to threaten to stop buying our currency so that we'll have more trade and that will give us the growth. But um, I'm just joking. But, um, <laughs> It would be a good thing. Okay, so, so what do we do? Uh, certainly, I would look to make some cuts in the defense budget, although, as I say, they are projected, well, you were saying, Josh was saying, that uh, they are, we are projected to see some, the defense budget go back to, you know, closer to the pre-2001 uh, levels, pre-9-11 levels. But in any case, I think there's more to cut there. Um, in terms of other areas, uh, we do have to do a lot about health care, and that's, again, both a public and private sector story. Um, one of the places, incredible amount of waste, we're, we're currently spending about $300 billion a year on pharmaceuticals. That's projected to be about $450 billion a year by 2020. More than half of that comes through the government. Um, for the reason why I emphasize this, uh, $300 billion is about 2% of GDP. That's real money even in Washington. Um, drugs are cheap. Drugs are cheap. You go to you know Walmart, you can get most drugs, you get most generics for four bucks a prescription. The reason why drugs will cost three, four hundred, sometimes a thousand dollars a prescription is patent protection. Incredibly inefficient way to produce prescription drugs. Um, this is again, I understand the political realities. The pharmaceutical industry is really powerful. Pete Peterson won't give me money to go after the pharmaceutical industry. I understand the political realities. Believe me, I understand that completely. But if you ask me, how do you get healthcare costs down? 
well, if we found a more efficient way to finance prescription drug research, and we already spend $30 billion a year, by the way, through the National Institutes of Health. So anyone wants to look at me, well, you can't imagine the government. Well, the government's doing it, so we, bet we don't have to imagine it. They are doing it. Um, but if we were to say roughly double that, we would be matching more or less what the industry currently pays on research. And since you paid for the research up front, then all drugs could be sold as generics. Those would be enormous savings. As I say, going out to 2020, the, the savings would be on the order of $400 billion a year, uh, roughly half of that accruing to the government. Um, another part of the story, Medicare, again, I, you know, I recognize it's very hard to get Medicare costs down. Could they be the same as Belgium? Well, one way to make them the same as Belgium is let people go to Belgium. Suppose we gave people Medicare vouchers. Um, you set a, a Medicare voucher at a price that's halfway between the cost of people, people, what we pay for health care in the United States or what we pay for Medicare in the United States and what you would pay in the countries that have longer life expectancies than the United States, which would include, of course, Belgium, Germany, just about everyone else. And people could pocket the difference. Okay, so you can go to Belgium, you can go to Germany, you can go to the UK, and we'd even have a premium for those countries, give them 15% more than it costs them, so they have a reason to let you in. And you put the rest of the money in your pocket. That's a really good way to save money on Medicare. Helps the patients, helps the government, and helps the receiving country. That's a good way to get costs down. Um, may have to do other things, but I think that's a really good start. Uh, Social Security, important point to keep in mind. People talk about cutting benefits. Um, two points I'll make. One, if we talk about cutting benefits for near retirees, these are the people who just got killed by the collapse of the housing bubble. Um, I find that, to my mind, kind of unconscionable. It's like, how many times are we going to kick you in the face? They weren't the ones that mismanaged the economy. It, it was people like Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, and George Bush, and Henry Paulson. Those are the people that mismanaged. And you could throw Bill Clinton in there. I'll be bipartisan. Um, those are the people that mismanaged the economy, that you take away Social Security benefits that they paid for is to my mind really unconscionable. And that raises the longer term question. If you look at projections of returns on Social Security taxes going out 10, 15, 20 years, they're actually not very good. So the idea that you're going to save money by cutting benefits while leaving taxes where they are, that's kind of ripping people off. We're, we're asking people to pay Social Security taxes that are being used for other parts of the budget. That's not a very, to my mind, honest thing to do. Um, the last place I'd just say if we want to get money, a great place to get money, tax financial speculation. Um, I've done some analyses of this. I, I, I calculate you could raise somewhere on the order of 1% of GDP by taxing financial speculation, you know, sort of stuff the folks on, the folks on Wall Street do. Um, Japan did this, and they were getting about 8 tenths of a percent of GDP back in the 80s through financial transactions tax. Uh, the UK still does it. They just tax stock trades, just stock trades. They don't tax derivatives, futures just stock trades, they get three tenths of a percent of GDP just doing that. That would be the equivalent of about $40 billion a year in the United States. So there's a lot of money that could be had there, and to my mind it's all for the good because I don't see these transactions, or at least the vast majority of them, as doing any productive purpose. So you could raise a lot of money that way and make the financial markets, in my view, more efficient. So it's a pure win-win. Thanks. Uh, one area where there was some agreement was about the importance of health care costs to all this, although there seems to be some disagreement about how easily it would be to reduce it. And, uh, and Josh, you showed a nice graph showing uh, the implications or your projected implications of health care reform. Uh, but you also expressed a bit of uncertainty about that since it's going to depend quite a bit on how well it's implemented and how well the cost containment measures are implemented. Um, I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit in more detail about that so that people can know what to be on the lookout when they read news reports of what is happening around the implementation of health care reform. Yeah, I mean, when you look at what reform did to try and control costs, the two main efforts, uh, they did it two ways. One on the demand side, which is uh, patients being more cost sensitive uh, when it comes to health care. And so uh, the legislation implemented a um, kind of a Cadillac plan tax, uh, which uh, attempts to begin to limit the amount of tax-free health insurance you get through your employer. And the idea is that if you start implementing this cap, uh, you'll start to increase people's wages, so they'll pay more in taxes. At the same time, they'll start using less health care because they'll be more cost sensitive. They won't, they'll have more cost sharing, more co-pays, because the cost of those health insurance plans will start uh, trying to fit in under the cap. So benefits become less generous, and when benefits are less generous, you have less health care spending. So that's on the demand side. It's kind of a, a crude way 
to control healthcare costs. Mm -hmm. So keep a lookout on the Cadillac tax and whether it actually happens or not. Yeah, I mean, originally it was supposed to start in 2014. At the last minute, they moved the implementation date to 2018. They raised the cap from where it was originally. So uh, I think that's going to be a major fight whether that actually happens. Um, now, if you know the President's Commission or anyone else is looking for a way to raise revenue uh, quickly in the short term and in the long term, I think if you do something even more major on uh, tax-free health insurance, um, that would be better for lowering health care costs. It would be more efficient because it's one of the uh, most regressive, least efficient uh, forms of uh, tax loopholes that we have. Uh, so you could replace it with some sort of credit that everyone gets that's refundable, and then all of a sudden you bring a huge more amount of rationality into the system. So uh, anything we do to make that stronger uh, is better for long-run health care costs. And then they also took uh, efforts on the supply side where you're going to start trying to shift how doctors are paid uh, based on quality instead of quantity, moving away from the fee-for-service system. Um, there are a bunch of experiments and pilot projects in the legislation. Uh, and then there's something called an IPAB, a Medicare commission, that's supposed to evaluate that and shift Medicare uh, to paying for quality uh, instead of quantity. Um, unfortunately, the IPAB was um, uh, also, uh, sh their jurisdiction was shrunk. Uh, they're not allowed to affect hospital provider payments until 2018, even though they start meeting in 2015. And they're not allowed to do anything about doctor payments under what we call the sustainable growth rate. So uh, again, if that IPAB is weakened, you have less chance of these experiments actually making their way into Medicare and making their way into the general healthcare system. Uh, so the key for that, which it, it's, the IPAB is good because Congress has to accept their recommendations unless they pass a law to overrule them that is signed by the president. As we know, it's very difficult to get legislation through Congress. So year after year, that IPAB is going to be making recommendations, and the chances of Congress year after year being able to avoid them are pretty slim, unless they just let the whole thing eliminate the whole thing, uh, which uh, would be really devastating, I think. So the IPAB is the other key. A and then just to see whether Congress and the president, whoever it is then, um, uh, winds up um, not implementing the things we know will work after we see these experiments and pilot projects. If there's good evidence out there that something like bundled payments or accountable care organizations, which are all very technical ways to make doctors be more cost effective, if, if those things start getting really good results and Congress and the President don't start uh, shifting Medicare to paying for those systems, uh, then again, we're in deep trouble. I'll just go through a quick thing about the Cadillac tax. I think there's another case where we agree. Um, I, to my mind, this is a very good thing because it, it helps to move us away from the system of employer-provided care that really makes no sense. I mean, I, I say this in part, I'm an employer, I'm co-director, and we have to waste time, I have to waste my time, our, our organization has to waste time looking at health care plans, which is not good use of my time or anyone else's time. And, you know, it's just this historical accident that employers came to be the main providers of health care due to price controls in World War II, and this was a way that, or wage, price and wage controls, this was a way that employers could get around to, in fact, offer workers higher pay, was offering them health care benefits. And it's something that really makes no sense, and, you know, if we could move, the, to my mind, the quicker we can move away from that, the better. It just, it just it creates inefficiencies and creates a very bad system. Uh, I would very much like to ask questions all day long, but I, I think I better open it up uh, for the for the crowd in case there's any any questions from the audience. So there's a mic set up if anybody has any questions just uh, introduce yourself and uh, you can ask the panelists unless you want me to keep going. Is there any other way to uh, gauge the actual extent of a deficit except to relate it to GDP? What about to, to, to total assets? I mean, we have an enormous amount of yeah. assets in this country, and that's different from other countries. Um, generally, when you look at household budgets, you look at individuals, and I, I realize that this is not always a very good way to make comparisons between individuals and countries, but we look at debt in terms of what total assets are. Well, it is good to keep in mind total assets. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm partial to GDP for the simple reason GDP tends to fluctuate less than assets. So if we were to take a measure of assets, 
that, you know, say we're looking at housing values, well, they just plummeted $6 trillion, so something would look like our debt situation. Uh, oh, okay, no, okay, you could look at productive assets. That would, that, that would be a reasonable measure, and it wouldn't be that hard to do, because, again, it's important point to keep in mind, you know, that as a country, you know, I often make the joke, well, we have much bigger debt than Zimbabwe. Does that mean we're in bad, worse shape than Zimbabwe? Well, of course not, because we have a much more productive economy. And one way in which to, you could do that, an alternative to looking at GDP certainly would be what, what's the value of our productive assets. But even there, you would have to be careful. You presumably want to count, have some count of the, the value of our educated labor force, our research and development. Again, you could do that, but it's, it's not that simple. And, you know, in principle, you want a number that's fairly hard in the sense you can't just, you know, say it's uh, 40 trillion and then recalculate and go, no, it's actually 80 trillion. I mean, not that we'll get an exact number, but if we say it's 40 trillion, we want to know, you know, it's not more than 50, not less than 30. We want to have some so idea. It is relevant to the question of how much is too much. And yeah, relative yeah. To, to what, uh, yeah. To but again, I would make the point we should distinguish between debt. And Japan does, it's, it's, I don't know what, why this is the case, but if you look at the IMF, for example, and you go, what's Japan's debt? This is when I first discovered this because I knew the deficits Japan was running. They're running deficits of 10, 11 percent GDP. And I look at the IMF and they go, Japan's debt to GDP ratio is like 115 percent. I go, how could that be? They've been running debts at 10 to 15 percent GDP for 15 years. That doesn't add up. And that's because their central bank's been holding it. So if your central bank's holding it, it's not a liability. The government owns it, so it's not, it's not a liability. So what you really want is this net debt measure that's, that's debt outside of the government. I got a quick thing. What's the, uh, what's the percentage outside of the What's the point? <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's a little complicated because they, they hold – the interest they got last year was $77 billion, and that came – some of that from government bonds. It's, it's more than a third. It's about 37 percent of our total interest payments, but some of that they're holding mortgage-backed securities. So that's not government debt they're holding there, but those are insured by Fannie and Freddie, which is, of course, insured by the government. I'd like to ask a question about uh, controlling health care costs. I'm a, I'm a, Brit, a Brit by birth. And having lived here for now 40 years or so, I wonder if Americans are willing to put up with uh, the, the kind of rationing that uh, would be required, in fact, to uh, bring health care costs uh, under control. I mean, in Britain, uh, we've developed uh, o over time a fairly explicit set of, stand uh, of rationing rules and tools and so on to control health care costs. Uh, my sense of it is that uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a lot of education for Americans to become comfortable with that type of ration. Or well, so, or certainly a change in attitudes. I mean, I think, you know, the first thing is that, unfortunately, Americans have been quite comfortable with some crazy forms of rationing. Well, because they think we, they're going to live we, forever. Well, no, I mean, right now we have rationing of health care just by income and by specific job yeah. category. And, and that seems much less rational than rationing by what is going to actually make you feel better at the best cost. So uh, it does require societal change, but we're putting up with the craziest, most screwed up healthcare system in the world with rationing completely devoid of any uh, rationale. And I think uh, it shouldn't be too hard to switch Americans' minds to start thinking of rationing in a much more sensible way. Well, I'd make a couple points. I mean, again, agreeing very much with what Josh is saying here. Um, one is there is all sorts of rationing. Even, you know, in my own case, we've had to deal with this because my wife has a chronic illness, and we have, in the scheme of things, very good insurance. I'm sure better than 80, if not 90 percent of the population. But we face rationing. There, there are certain things that go, no, we're going to pay for it. You know, so, so we do face, you know, forms of rationing. It's not horrible, but we do face that. The other point is that, strictly speaking, you know, neither in the U.K. nor the U.S. do you literally have rationing. It's not illegal. You have a private system in, in a parallel system in the UK. Most people can't afford it. But if you have the money, you could pay for it. So it's not strictly speaking rationing. It's not as though you get arrested that, you know, if you have the money, you have money sitting in your bank and you want to pay for a form of surgery that the national health care system doesn't cover. And I don't think anyone envisions a story where we're going to arrest people for getting, you know, paying on their own for surgery. So the idea is that we'll have a health care system that will pay for procedures that have demonstrated their medical effectiveness. But if, you know, someone's got the money and they feel there's something that will help them, they'll go ahead and do it. American by choice, but European by birth. Uh, 
the Dutch system has mostly been held up as one of the ones to follow. Uh, and if we look at that, they have actually, over the last two years, uh, had major reforms that uh, brought them closer to our system. They, they're pretty eclectic, but they have made <coughs> the reforms to ensure that there was more private marketization in the market, uh, in the healthcare market than they've ever had before. So they had a parallel system very similar to the British system up until two years ago. So they're trying to go to private. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I would say, you know, clearly you have mixes of public and private. I mean, for example, the German system is mostly private, uh, private insurance. Um, you have mixes, you know, throughout you know, the other developed countries. And what's striking is there is this large gap in cost. I mean, clearly some of the systems are better than others, so I don't want to say that they're all equal that way. But there is a very large gap in cost between the United States and all of them. Um, but again, so, you know, which one's better? We could have an argument. I wouldn't be the one to have the argument with because I'm no expert on that. Isn't there a value to the growth of health care? Health is not a public bad. It's a public good. If, uh, I mean, I would much prefer to have an operation that extends my life than three more television sets. It's a productive activity. And within certain boundaries, we ought to be welcome its, its growth. I agree. We just need to be willing to pay for it if we're going to have the government yeah. have the programs grow faster than the economy. Yeah, and I agree with that point. Again, just making the point that I'm all for us spending more to get good health. I'm not for us spending more to have more bureaucracy, have unnecessary procedures. So if you know, if you know, if we were if we were spending twice as much as everyone else in the world, and we go, look, we you know we're healthier, we're you know we're healthy into our 70s and 80s, and you know, well that probably is a pretty good deal. I'd be willing to pay that, but there's no evidence for that. So so it's it, we're just spending more, but not getting the return. And we're leaving a whole portion uninsured for at least the last 20 years, which by definition means you're having worse health. Next. Yeah, it's sort of strange because, you know, we're the, the wealthiest people in the country, which would include us, uh, people in this room. Uh, we have very good health care, probably excessively good health care. And, and then the poorest people have very good health care, which they don't pay a dime for. And it's the people in the middle who who are the problem. But uh, I think you're right that, that there has to be more price incentive put in the system because there's some, some people just abuse the system. Every time they have sniffles or pull a muscle while they're running, they're, they're, they're running to the doctor because it's basically free to go there. Um, uh, I shouldn't say this much for example because my colleague behind me who knew what I'm talking about, but my secretary has taken her, who has two very healthy kids, I mean, she, she's taking her kids to the doctors twice a week. I mean, this is ridiculous. But it, it costs, costs almost nothing to do so, so there's no disincentive to do it. Uh, one comment on uh, monetarizing the debt. Uh, I've heard these statements uh, ever since I've been studying economics, and, and, and a lot of Keynesian types tend to think that that's going to push interest rates uh, down and uh, you know if that was true we'd have negative interest rates today um, you know I, and if if the if the Chinese and the other foreign foreigners stop buying our debt I don't think it's going to be an insignificant increase in interest rates like uh, one of you pointed out I, I think that dr the change would be far more dramatic than a, a few tenths of a percent well, in terms of uh, the debt, I mean, I don't know how you get a negative interest rate because I, I don't know how you can make someone lend money at a negative rate. I mean, I can put up $1,000 uh, to get 990 it would be if you, you know. Uh, okay, well, that aside, I mean, the, the um, as I say, the, the, the record is we do have a lot of investors in the United States who are willing to hold U.S. debt at very low rates, and they're holding comparable assets at not very much higher rates. So it is a little hard for me to imagine that there would be all that much of an increase in the debt if uh, interest rate on the debt, if uh, we, we saw a substantial reduction in foreign buying. I mean, I guess we'll find out if that happens. Um, the other point, just very quickly, in health care, the vast majority of our health care costs are concentrated among the, the very sick. Um, so, which isn't to say there aren't people who go to the, I mean, I personally hate to see the doctor, you know, I don't think, uh, I don't trust them to do me good, but, but uh, you know, the, the problem that you have when you try to incentivize that is that it's very hard to find a way to structure a system where 
you're, you want people to see the doctor early if they have a problem. So you don't want to put in a structure that discourages someone from going when they first, you know, have the first signs of a heart problem or the first signs of can't, whatever it might be. You don't want to discourage them. But, yeah, you don't want, uh, you know, every time a kid gets sniffles, that's a waste of everyone's time for them to see the doctor. It's very hard to design a system that will distinguish between those two, though. So here's my question to you, then. It, I mean, we agree that a majority of the spending is done by a minority of the very sick, and, and the elderly, it's compounded as well, the older you get the more health care costs. So how do you square that with your idea of going to other countries to get health care? You're not going to take 80-year-old heart patients to Belgium to get... Oh, I, I think a lot of them might move there, you know, that you have a lot of people with family ties, personal ties to other countries. I think a lot of people might just pick up and move there. Only because of having this incentive of a Medicare Well, you're, you're, you're talking about if you do the calculations, you know, which I've done, um, if you do the calculations and you go out 25, 30 years where you have those really huge deficits, you're talking about you know, you'd be able to pocket on the order of 10, 15, 20,000 a year in many cases, which given that most people are living on Social Security payments that are roughly that size, people would be able to double their incomes moving there. So I think you would get a lot of people with that, make that, with that would make that decision. Even though they could move now and get free health insurance by living over there anyway? It's a very mixed story. Uh, countries are not anxious to take, uh, you know, U.S. citizens who come there and give them free care. That's, that's not generally true. Well, I certainly have more questions. Uh, let me ask something that uh, maybe this is kind of specific. I'm not sure either of you will know the answer to. But in some political circles, uh, concerns about the deficit seem to dovetail with concerns about immigration, especially illegal immigration. And I was wondering whether uh, the flow of immigrants improves or worsens the federal deficit situation. Do either of you know? Well, it, it depends how you put that in the sense that we have obviously a lot of immigrants here who are many of them working off the books. Um, if they worked on the books and they pay taxes, that would almost certainly improve the situation. Um, there's a little bit of a mixed story because you have Social Security, whereas if they, you have a lot of people paying to Social Security, whereas they don't expect to get benefits. They, you know, they're, they're entitled to them, in fact, but they don't, they don't, they're likely not going to get them. If they were to get them, that would make the deficit somewhat worse. These aren't big factors in the scheme of things, though. I'd say you know, if we're trying to make decisions on immigration, there, there are many, many other issues that are almost certainly far more important than their impact on the deficit. And immigration could help the worker to retiree ratio and keep, and keep more people in the workforce because immigrants tend to have more children and they're younger. So uh, a, re a reasonable immigration policy with an eye towards having more workers um, and a younger population could actually help on net, I, I think, from what I've seen. Uh, Isn't that ratio it, it, it's somewhat a fiction? If you look at any time in the past, one working person supported X number of dependents, but they happen to be children. Now one worker supports X number of dependents, and they happen to be retired people. The worker is still supporting about the same number of dependents. And would well, the difference is the government supports the older people as well, and not the younger people. Well, but the children are paid for it. We pay for their education. That tends to be at the state and local level. So that's why I'm saying it's 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 not. It's. I think we have other issues to think about with immigration. The the the, the effect on the budget is probably not too much one way or the other. Well, you certainly hear those claims, which is why why I want to ask. Um, another uh, another thing that that is out there, and so I just wanted to get your opinion about this, or at least your sense of what this means. I was struck by this Gallup poll that came out recently, which found that Americans believe, on average, that 50 cents of every dollar of federal spending is wasted. Uh, are Americans right? And if so, where do all these wasted funds go? And if they're not right, what is it that they're expressing here? Well, I remember a study done some years ago, a poll by Pew. I think it was Pew. I may be impugning the wrong or I'm not impugning it, it's an interesting study, but uh, maybe attributing it to the wrong organization. But they asked people questions about where they thought budget dollars were going. And people, like, grossly overestimated the amount of money they thought was going to foreign aid. They grossly overestimated the amount of money that was going to, to welfare, TANF, however you want to call it. And to give you numbers, I mean, it's been a while, but these were ballpark numbers. They estimated around 30 percent was going to foreign aid. The, the actual number in foreign aid is somewhat ambiguously defined, but even if you define it in the most generous possible way, it would be about eight-tenths of one percent. You know, so it's, you know, just grossly overestimated that. Um, and in the case of welfare, at least the normal TANF program, it's, it's about six-tenths of one percent. If you throw in SSI and some other programs, you could probably get up to about two percent. 
um, but they were grossly overestimating it. So it, it was the sort of situation I was looking at this, I was going, well, you know, if I thought, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, I generally think it's a good thing we spend some money in Fort Aid. I think it's a good thing we spend some money so poor people aren't in complete poverty. So I'm not opponents of those programs. On the other hand, if I thought 30% of our budget was going to, to welfare, I would probably say that program needs to be cut. You know, you go 30% is going to welfare and we have so many people living in poverty, we're doing something wrong. So I, I think that there is some real confusion about where the budget dollar is going and that leads people to, to think there's a lot of waste in places where there may not be waste. And then also you do get the case, the boondoggles, which get a lot of attention, the bridge to nowhere in Alaska, which, you know, you can argue whether or not it's a boondoggle, but the point is, in the scheme of things, it wasn't that much money. You know, so, you know, most of us never see, two, what was it, 200 million for that bridge? Mo yeah. you know, in any case, there's some money most of us are never going to see, so it sounds really big, mm -hmm. but when you're talking about, and this wasn't even a one-year expenditure, but, uh, you know, a budget that's spending three and a half trillion, 200 million you aren't even going to find. And part of it is signaling from irresponsible politicians. Like I said, discretionary spending is, you know, non-defense discretionary spending is one-sixth of the budget, and yet that's the only area you ever hear politicians talk about cutting and, and exercising restraint. And I think that um, people hear that and think, oh, well, if, if my politician or my candidate thinks we need to cut that, he's telling me there's a bunch of waste there and that's what's going to solve the problem. Earmarks, if we get rid of earmarks, we won't have this budget problem. Um, then you have a, it, it's, it's seriously misinforming and, and harming our ability to actually tackle the larger challenges. And not to be gratuitously partisan, but if you look at the Republican pledge that they just released, uh, the very specific parts are the tax cuts and the things that are going to increase the deficit. And the very non-specific parts are where they're going to cut spending. And they devote an awful lot of time to talking about cutting the federal workforce and, and these really small things that are major planks that are supposed to outweigh what everyone knows are huge tax cuts. And again, it's just further misinformation. And I think um, sometimes people concerned about fiscal responsibility get tarred by uh, people who use fiscal responsibility as a guise to promote their favored policies and then look the other way when um, their favored policies happen to be the ones that increase the deficit by the largest. Uh, well, we're going to have to let that be the last word. Uh, I want to uh, uh, have everyone join me in a round of applause for our guests. So thank you. <laughs>